Day 303 of the Ukrainian War Map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian War. Juzzy here, and today is another update as I take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine. And as always, I'll take a look at those Russian military losses as we take a look at the exhaustion of the Russian forces. So now over 100,000 Russian military personnel have well and truly died in this needless war. In fact, nearly at 101k as of today. And add to that another 300k or so wounded as well. And add to that, even after all that, these are conservative figures. So it's no wonder that Russia couldn't sustain the 200k troop figure for the original SMO, so the quote-unquote special military operation, causing them to perform a partial military mobilization, adding about an extra 400,000. And now they're even talking about adding another 500,000 roughly to their reserve forces. So to pop it up to about 1.5 million. Probably because the other 1 million are, are all but gone and expended in this needless war now. Oh, and I haven't even mentioned the, the ghost mobilization where Russia pulls many, many men from the poorer eastern parts of the country. Figures of which aren't included on Russia's official tallies of how many mobilized men exist. And my larger point here is that, well, also that many more are clearly wounded and many more are clearly killed in action. In the end, really causing Russia to have longer term economic impacts that will make everybody's head spin wondering why they started this war in the first place. But quickly to the figures, a <laughs> couple of tanks, a couple of ACVs, six artillery, and even one MLRS. So that's the multiple launch rocket systems. You don't see that every day, so always a bit of a score there. Then we'll move back to the map and we'll start out in the Russian city of Murmansk. Uh, really, really quite high up there, in fact. So, oh wow, really high. Where Russia's only aircraft carrier, the Admiral Kuznetsov, uh, caught fire and it uh, was well docked up north near Finland, as you can see there. And I don't have an actual photo for this, but what's even funnier is the photo I'm showing you right now isn't even the current fire. This photo is from an older fire that the aircraft carrier was subjected to way back in 2018 or so. So Sergei the Smoker never quits. Then, still in Russia, uh, more fires in Moscow. This one was suspiciously located at one of the garages of a military unit. Then, one last Russian fire for the day. So this one was in the Saratov Oblast where unknown persons set fire to a military commissariat. I can't imagine why. Then we'll move back into the Ukraine map itself. Start out in, uh, let's see, start out in, in Kharkiv, the Kharkiv Oblast today. Right up the top north section, in fact. So this is where Russian forces are shelling border towns all along the north of the Oblast here. And these are just mostly small towns as well. So Russia is doing this because artillery shelling is cheap and usually in, de uh, in, in decent supply for Russia. But it's, it's also low accuracy and indiscriminate and useless in terms of providing any real Russian uh, strategic military value there. Then we'll move across next door to the Svartove region. So this is Russian occupied where we're getting a lot of reports, uh, continued reports really, of Russian mobilized units being sent into battle after refusing to fight. Now, I've even got a video of one such uh, man that eventually got captured by the AFU, just as he wanted, where he starts to talk about Russian forces constantly sending him back to the front line after his desertion, like four or five times. And I'll show all that uh, in the upcoming days, surely. Then moving down a little bit further. So this is the third day in a row now that uh, Russia is shelling Shavono Papivka which will lead into, in all likelihood, uh, meaning that that's controlled by the AFU. Then moving a bit further down, the Ukrainian forces hit and destroyed a Russian ammunition depot on the eastern outskirts of Solodar. So that one is right there. 
Then we'll move across quickly to uh, the adjacent Bakhmut region, obviously a very heavily contested area. We've got some footage. Uh, this is just a still, though, of a Ukrainian soldier saying, uh, quote, Bakhmut, today, Russia continues its suicidal attacks and smashes into Ukrainian defense. The situation is under control. Now, Russia likely still has a very small foothold into the, the very eastern outskirts of the city. But also, the AFU targeted Russian forces outside Bakhmut uh, within Russian-held territory. It seemed to have kicked out the, the Wagner forces from much of their easterly held positions. In fact, I don't often show this next part, but I'll pop in the coordinates where the Wagner group were essentially snuffed out of their nest or little hidey hole. So I'll just copy from outside, paste it in, and I'll show you guys, click on that one. So in the Russian held territory in this case, and they were actually hiding in a drywall factory. Then after that, there's even more recent reports of Russia using incendiary munitions around Bakhmut or the region, but it's hard to geolocate exactly where this one was just at the moment. Of course, this is a dick move and usually illegal and illegal to use in a, a residential or civilian environment. Then moving more west, uh, the Russian army shelled Mald, uh, sorry, Madalvinka. And I just have to really zoom out to find that one. Here we go. So this is just about 10 miles north of uh, the, the front line there, as you can see, pop that up. Oh, well, actually 12 kilometers, more like seven and a half, eight miles. So Madalnivka, it's an unexpected place for them to hit. They maybe have been attempting some counter battery fire, uh, for instance, thinking that an M270 or a HIMARS was there, but hard to say. Then in Kherson, so the Ukrainian forces hit a makeshift Russian airstrip in the uh, settlement of Kakovka, so a little bit north there, obviously on the south side of the Dnipro River, uh, obviously also Russian occupied. And also in that strike, uh, 20 units of equipment were reportedly damaged and over 150 Russian soldiers were either wounded in action or killed in action, WIA or KIA. But a lot of this is really making sense to me. So Russia would certainly choose to set up some makeshift airstrips because after 10 months of warfare, they've realized now, it seems like they've realized now that using existing Ukrainian airstrips in Russian controlled land is not a healthy idea. But of course now with this news, it turns out that makeshift airstrips also aren't the healthiest idea either. Then we'll move across to Crimea, so the Russian-held Crimean Peninsula. Some welcoming news here, really. A lot of pro-Ukrainians uh, do in fact live here, so check this out. So, local residents of Sevastopol and Simferopol and Kerch continue to resist the, the temporary Russian occupation. So the blue slash yellow ribbons are, are working everywhere. Then to add to that, uh, partisans raised a Ukrainian flag in the town of Mizvodny, so there in the Crimean Peninsula as well. Then, even more of this stuff in the last day, probably my favourite stealth partisan movement, so pro-Ukrainians in uh, Simferopol, probably from the local council government, put up some Christmas light decorations in, you guessed it, yellow and blue. And I really like this because even if the Russian version of Voldemort from Schindler's List pulled you up on this, you would have really good plausible deniability. They just came like that out of the box. Then we'll move across to some news for the day. So uh, this news now is about 36 hours old, but I wasn't uh, in yesterday and think that it's still worthy of a mention. So of course, Zelensky visited Washington and spoke in the House of Representatives there at Congress. Uh, even before he spoke, he uh, received a really warm welcome. So Zelensky thanked the US for all of their help and called for further actions against uh, Russian aggression. The US Congress gave a standing ovation 21 times. 
and it was an emotionally filled uh, address from Zelensky. So I watched the full half hour speech, and perhaps you did too. And halfway through it, I, I really enjoyed how he said that uh, the following, so quote, your money is not charity. It's an investment in global security and democracy that we handle in the most responsible way. So the US has spent about 5.7% of their military budget on Ukrainian military aid, which represents a pretty good return on investment for taking out another superpower who is these days considered more of a regional superpower. And of course, I'm talking about Russia here. Then also, uh, President Zelensky met with uh, President Biden, who reaffirmed support by saying that the Ukrainian people will not be alone in the face of Russian aggression. So all around, it was just really a, a symbolic event. And I know that some of you guys saw the meme post I created for this event uh, yesterday when I couldn't make a video. Thanks for the comments on that one. Oh, and also, fun fact, Zelensky is the first head of state to visit the US in time of war. The last time that happened was when Winston Churchill came in 1941 during World War II. So really, very symbolic stuff. Then in some other news, uh, Russia plans to station newly formed military units uh, near the border with uh, Finland. Uh, so the, the Russian Defense Minister, uh, Mr. Yes Man himself, Sergei Shogu, said the move is connected to Finland and Sweden's bid to, to join NATO. Probably just a muscle flex of a, of a token force, just a really small force there. Then in some other news, the US announced a new military aid package worth $1.8 billion for Ukraine. Uh, quite an effective one, as you can see here too. It includes one Patriot air defense battery, but also a whole bunch of other important things, including additional ammunition for HIMARS, 500 Excalibur shells. I really like this, these ones. So it just says precision guided 155 millimeter artillery rounds, but they're talking about the Excalibur shells there. I like to sometimes call mini HIMARS. They've, uh, they've got the accuracy just like HIMARS. Uh, they can be shot pretty quickly, quickly enough anyway, and uh, they don't have the range as much. I think it's about 50 kilometers, 30 miles, but, but still really decent uh, effective stuff there. Then also you can see more harm missiles. So these are the ones specifically designed to take out Russian's air defenses. And a whole bunch of uh, mortar systems and rounds and other artillery shells as well. Pretty impressive stuff. Then in some other news, Switzerland seems no longer neutral. So <laughs> neutral Switzerland is not just starting to, but rather expanding its already existing sanctions list against Russia. So the Federal Council declared or decided to impose sanctions against about 150 additional individuals and about 150 uh, legal entities, all Russian ones, of course, there. Then in some lighter side of news, so we all know Russia leave a lot of their men behind in the war. But meanwhile, Ukraine, quite the opposite. They won't even leave a drone behind. As you can see with this uh, drone evac footage, it's, it's a long video, but I'll chop it up to, to make it shorter, as at the very end of it, it shows a successful drone recovery from another drone. Then in some funnies to round it off, so this one is quite interesting to me. So previously, Russia called the supply of Patriot systems an escalatory measure. Now they're saying, they're fine with the supply to Ukraine. So Putin said just today the following, quote, the Patriot system is quite an outdated system. It doesn't work as well as our S-300 missiles. Let them supply them, we'll destroy them as well. So this is great news for so many reasons. First of all, it means that the USA and 18 other countries that operate these systems <coughs> cough, cough, Germany, can supply as many as they want. No issues at all with it being an escalatory action. Second of all, Putin's advisors seem to have put him in some sort of an information bubble or lack thereof information bubble uh, that Putin believes uh, his somehow his notoriously inaccurate S-300 Soviet era missiles are better than uh, the Patriot AD systems, air defense systems, which is actually some generations newer uh, and designed with the S-300s in mind. 
Then, third of all, the part where Putin said uh, Russia will, quote, destroy them as well. So I'm not aware of Russia being successful in destroying any NATO air defense hardware at all, let alone all of them. I looked it up as well, not one. And it's funny but annoying, you know, when I have to spend half an hour looking to fact check Putin when I already know that he's lying in the first place. But I do it for you guys. So in the end, I think that Putin is basically in some type of information vacuum, making uh, his ego therefore so big that he's basically telling the international community to arm Ukraine with these batteries. That's so great. I love it. I love it so much. Then in a second funny, just in case that first one wasn't exactly funny or enough to tickle your fancy, recently a Russian politician said that Russia was preparing to... or sorry, preparing some sort of surprise in response to Finland and Sweden's decision to join NATO. Well, in the end, maybe what he meant was protesters of a sort throwing sledgehammers at the Finnish embassy in Moscow. And this is just so staged. Just like the protests at the UK embassy, also in Moscow, from back in August time, which uh, I covered that as well. I mean, look at the demographics here again. They're all young, skinny dudes, likely from the propaganda troll farm office which I believe I actually have the physical address for and I'll show you guys in a later video. Then these protesters of a sort, they want this obviously to be recorded, to pretend that there is some kind of proof of Russian civilian dissent or dislike towards Finland and Sweden wanting to join NATO. And it seems really even more fake because they're not really putting any emotion into it, are they? There's just no aggression, just pop in, pop out. So in the end, I guarantee some of these people are paid trolls in the comment section, instructed to do this by their handlers bidding. So that's it for today, guys. Uh, thanks for watching. Please leave a comment, subscribe, hit that like button. Thanks for all of your support. I'll definitely do another video tomorrow. Probably not Christmas Day. <laughs> we'll all be busy, some of us. You know, maybe you'll be having a quiet one. In many ways, I will be too. But, um, you know, I've got to do a few things in there, family related, obviously. Get it out of the way. But, uh, you know, it can be fun, you know. So, yeah, thanks again for all your support. And I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers.